Good afternoon, and welcome to the second in the 2014 series of ELECT's webinars on MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. I'm Pamela Blue, your host for today's session. This, this afternoon, I'm Kendrick and Irene Gashuro from the City University of New York, whose presentation whose presentation is entitled, Through a MOOC Darkly, Understanding the MOOC Landscape and its Impact on Libraries' Digital Resources. Curtis Kendrick is the University Dean for Libraries and Information Resources at CUNY, where he is responsible for the integration of the CUNY library system with the teaching, learning, and research activities throughout the university, and for forging collaborations with other educational and cultural institutions to improve access to information resources. Curtis's partner for today's webinar is Irene Gashurov. Irene holds the position of communications writer for the Office of Library Services at CUNY, where her responsibilities include the promotion of library services and outreach to the university community and beyond. Curtis and Irene co-authored an article in the October 2, 2013 issue of Library Journal entitled Collaboration for Hard Times, which stressed the importance of collaboration in higher education in order to prepare for the future. Today's webinar will examine how MOOCs fit into that collaborative framework. Please use the question box on your screen to submit questions for Curtis and Irene. They will answer questions at the conclusion of their presentation. Curtis and Irene have interwoven a number of video clips into their presentation which is in the form of a conversation. Playing the video clips may test the technological limits of the GoToWebinar software, so please bear with us as we move from slideshow mode to video display. Today's presentation is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be sent to all attendees shortly after the conclusion of the program. And now, as I turn the program over to Curtis and Irene, there may be a slight delay. We don't pay MOOCs. A MOOC? I'm a MOOC, yeah. What's a MOOC? A MOOC? What's a MOOC? I don't know. What's a MOOC? You can't call me a MOOC. I can't? No. They're called MOOCs for massive, open, online courses, and they were going to upend higher education by putting free courses within reach of anyone with an internet connection. Now their likely impact is not so clear, and universities are grappling with huge new demands on their library materials and new technologies they don't yet know how to exploit or control. I'm Curtis Kendrick. University Dean for Libraries and Information Resources at the City University of New York. And I'm Irene Gashura, Communications Writer in CUNY's Office of Library Services. In this webinar, we'll look at how librarians can shape the conversation about MOOCs and guide faculty, administrator, and students through their intricacies. MOOCs are different from the online courses that universities have had for a while. They're offered by a small but growing number of ventures with techie sounding names like Coursera, Udacity, and edX. The founders are typically professors themselves and usually start in partnership with their home universities. The venture then looks to sign contracts with professors at other institutions. Some MOOCs are offered for college credit, most are for independent learners, and tens of millions have signed up to take at least one course. But this conversation might have seemed more urgent just a year or so ago. After a fast start, MOOCs seem to be struggling. This past fall, Sebastian Thrun, the Stanford professor who founded Udacity only two years ago, said he was rethinking his mission of offering MOOCs for college credit. 
only 25% of the students who had taken a Udacity course in remedial math at San Jose State had passed it. Through call the course a lousy product. And said he would focus instead on vocational training for corporations. And San Jose State suspended the Udacity pilot until January 2014. So why are we talking about MOOCs now? That sounds like an admission of defeat. Yes, but as Thrun also said, failure is part of how innovation works. It's part of the cycle of innovation for all emerging technologies. After the hype comes the phase that Gartner calls the trough of disillusionment. That's where MOOCs are today. Many still believe that MOOCs can improve the quality of teaching, cut costs, and ease faculty shortages, that they can be a democratizing force and bring higher learning to people who would otherwise never be able to get it. California lawmakers see MOOCs as the savior of their overburdened public university systems. John Hennessy, president of Stanford, calls them our best hope for making quality education affordable. Northeastern University President John Aoun says, we are witnessing the end of education as we know it, that MOOCs will replace higher education. Even if you wouldn't go so far, MOOCs are forcing us to rethink every element of higher education, how we teach, how we learn, and how we provide resources. And they've become a catalyst for a discussion of the biggest issues educators face access to higher learning, the cost of university, the value of a degree, and the unbundling of education. Most people still don't have access to learning at high levels. Tuition rates are soaring faster than the cost of living and health expenses. Only 36% of all 18 to 24-year-olds in the U.S. are enrolled in post-secondary education, and college completion rates are down. On average, College graduates earn 61% more than high school grads. The problem is even worse abroad. Only 7% of the world's people have any type of post-secondary schooling. The other 93% attend school for an average of only eight years. Yet, more and more people around the world see higher education as the path to social mobility. In 2010, a UNESCO report found that 150 million students were enrolled in post-secondary education globally. That's an increase of 50% from 2000. By 2025, the number of learners will reach 250 million, and many of them will want to study at American institutions. To meet that demand, the country would have to build the equivalent of three new colleges serving 30,000 students every week for the next 12 years. You might ask why they'd want to come. Students who manage to get their degrees aren't doing so well. More than half of recent American college graduates are out of work. Employers are saying they can't find people with the necessary skills. With technology-based industries changing so fast, the skills people learned just a few years ago are already outdated. So too few people have access to universities, and not enough who do are served well by them. All of these issues are making people wonder if college is still a good investment. Conservatives like William Bennett say that Americans considering a higher degree should look at college as a business proposition and evaluate the data critically. Student loan debt, return on investment, and lifetime salary earnings. He thinks the U.S. ought to emulate countries like Germany, where most young people are tracked into vocational training. People here may be ready for that sort of system. Their attitude to higher education has already changed a lot. They're going to college at, di at a different time of life and with different ideas about what they want. About 85% of students nowadays are non-traditional learners, older students, part-timers, or those who've returned to school in mid-career. As John Ayun of Northeastern puts it, 
the tsunami is not technology. It's the dramatic shift in student demographics. And what non-traditional students need is a flexible system that focuses on outcomes and helps them advance in their careers. For all these reasons, we're rethinking how we teach and provide educational resources. President Obama has said that colleges have to work harder to prevent tuition from going up year after year, and that his administration will encourage colleges to try new things that can provide a great education without breaking the bank. The Education Department is now soliciting ideas for programs that don't rely on seat time. Education is ripe for this type of change. Clayton Christensen, the Harvard Business School professor and innovation guru, says that to survive, universities must once again be responsive to the needs of learners by finding innovative, less costly ways of teaching. So how do we disrupt the existing system so more people have access to quality education? And where do libraries come in? Many believe the answer is online learning. Hal Plotkin, a senior policy advisor to Undersecretary of Education Martha Cantor, says that online learning can give the 93% of the people without access to higher education a chance to develop their talents. It will be an engine for economic growth, just like the Works Project Administration was during the Depression, by hiring millions of unskilled workers to build roads and public facilities and artists, writers, and performers, too, for arts, media, and literacy projects. The economy will never return to the levels of the post-World War II boom if the vast majority of people remain undereducated. As Plotkin says, the 7% of the world's talent cannot power the 93%. Online learning has already had a tremendous effect. By most estimates, it accounts for the great spike in education over the last 20 years. In 2013, a study by the Babson Survey Research Group found that nearly 66% of U.S. institutions consider online education to be critical to their long-term strategy. Today, more than 7.1 million American college students are taking at least one online course. Colleges have offered online courses to their own students for decades. Today, nearly every college offers online courses for enrolled students in one form or another. These courses are modeled on conventional campus courses, and students pay to take them. Introducing new technology is one way to disrupt higher learning. Another game-changing innovation is competency-based education, where schools award degrees based on demonstrated competency instead of credit hours. The goal of these programs is to show employers a graduate's value. They date back to the 1970s, but now they're moving online. Competency-based programs give students a lot of flexibility. The College for America, uh, an online program at Southern New Hampshire University, is aimed at working adults who've never earned a college degree. It's a project-based program, and it combines online learning with campus experience. Students proceed at their own pace, and SNHQ solicits local employers to contribute their ideas to the curriculum. At Empire State College in New York, students plan their own programs and get credit for what they've learned outside the classroom. And at Western Governors University in Salt Lake City, coursework is all online. Each student has access to a mentor throughout the program and to other students in online communities. The program takes half the time of regular college and has a tuition cost of about $3,000 a term, regardless of how many courses the students take. The true precursor of the MOOCs is open learning. Open courses offer no credits and have no fees. They're open to all comers, and they're entirely computer-based. The most renowned of these ventures is the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University. It began in 2010. The courses have no instructors, and students proceed through the modules at their own pace. The platform gives students targeted feedback to let them know if they're mastering a subject. 
The initiative also uses the platform to track progress. Each semester, Carnegie Mellon compiles performance data on the students who took the online courses. A team pours over the data and tweaks the courses according to how the students fared. Now, the courses in include simulations, virtual labs, and tutorials that give immediate feedback. The courses are open to all students and faculty. Since then, we've seen an explosion in online learning formats. A free online institution called University of the People received accreditation just this year. A host of providers have launched project-based courses on everything from writing a business plan to playing a musical instrument, as we see in this clip from James Taylor's online guitar lessons. <laughs> Here's the first in a series of guitar lessons that we plan to offer up in the months to come. Something I've been meaning to do for a long time. No doubt we'll learn as we go. Let's start with something simple. And now we have the MOOCs, which took the idea of Open Learning Institute and added live lectures. These courses made their debut at universities to help students succeed in their introductory classes. But they're radically different from the online courses colleges offer themselves. MOOCs are often taught by famous professors, and they're free to all comers. They're shorter in format than conventional online courses. Typically, they're a 20-minute lecture followed by a Q&A session once a week for four to six weeks. Tens of millions of learners have taken MOOCs in the past 10 years. The revolutionary aspect of MOOCs isn't necessarily the obvious one. People looking at MOOCs tend to focus on anytime, anywhere for free, but the most lasting impact may be the unbundling of education. MOOCs are pushing universities to shift from a vertical model to a horizontal one. Colleges have traditionally performed all of their functions in the classroom, knowledge creation, teaching, testing, and credentialing. But MOOCs have unbundled these functions and distributed them to different providers. Here's a hypothetical example of how unbundling would work. A professor at one institution serves as a primary lecturer, say, Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University, who teaches a Coursera course in sustainable development. A faculty member from Columbia or another institution, perhaps SUNY Albany, coaches a local student online. Coursera creates a community of practice for students taking the MOOC, and a private testing firm provides assessment leading to a certificate of completion that Jeffrey Sachs would then affirm. The, stu the SUNY student is able to enroll in the Columbia MOOC in lieu of the introductory economics course offered by SUNY's own faculty. This new model encourages the student to become an independent learner. As journalist Anya Kamenetz wrote in her book, DIYU, the whole purpose of the distance learning model is to help students draw their own maps. And doing that means patching together a customized education with a wide range of courses and credentials of completion, ending in a degree that leads to a career. Universities are still wary of MOOCs because behind them lies the profit motive. MOOCs are a creation of venture capitalists who are pouring a lot of money into technological innovation. They're operating outside the higher education bureaucracy, and they've taken the Silicon Valley financial model where the service initially is free, but eventually demand drives up the price. Who's to say that MOOCs won't follow the model of e-news? We're free right now, but we'll get you down the road. As a result, only 5% of institutions in the Babson Group survey now offer MOOCs. Another 9% have them in the planning stage. Students enrolled at college are leery, too. 
they don't see MOOCs as official because of their different format and because few universities offer them. The college credential remains the most important perceived economic value of higher education, but if efforts to help MOOC learners re receive credit have been only marginally successful. Most universities haven't figured out how to make MOOCs part of degree courses. Georgia Tech's master's program in computer science appears to break the impasse. It's the first degree program based entirely on MOOCs here provided by Udacity. The students take proctored exams to assess learning. The program also gives students access to tutors, online office hours, and other support services. Students who complete only a few courses would get a certificate. The program will continue despite Udacity's pullback from the college market. Another in the first wave of schools awarding credit for MOOCs is the University of Maryland University College. UM will grant credit for six courses that closely match its own introductory classes. To get the credit, students have to prove they know the material in either of two ways. For $150, they can take a version of the course that includes proctored exams. Or they can pay the college a fee for a prior learning assessment that measures their competency in the topic. As universities puzzle over how to grant credit for open courses, the MOOCs themselves are beginning to change. Some providers are redesigning MOOCs to become more interactive and to give students opportunities for offline experiences too, say where learners can work with a classmate or a mentor. And some MOOCs are no longer massive or very open. At Harvey Mudd College in California, Faculty are developing science MOOCs to help middle school teachers sharpen their skills for their physics and computer science classes. And as a fundraising initiative, Harvard will offer MOOCs ex exclusively to its alumni through a new venture called Harvard X for Alumni. MOOCs are also experimenting with hybrid forms. One of the most promising innovations is blended learning. The idea is to make is to take MOOC technology and combine it with in-person class help, which can improve education on campus. Anand Argawal, the head of edX, backs one variant called the flipped classroom. Students watch video lectures in advance and do homework and interact with a faculty member during classroom meetings. The most famous experiment in blending was at San Jose State University which piloted an engineering course using edX content in one of its sections. The flipped section, where students viewed the edX lecture online, had a pass rate of 91%. The two standard face-to-face -face classrooms had pass rates of 55% and 59%. Other trials had similar results. Shanna Smith Jaggers, assistant director of the Community College Research Center at Columbia University says that the flipped classroom is more effective than online instruction and in some cases more effective than face-to-face -face instruction. In this clip, edX founder Anant Argwal tells us that the flipped or blended learning courses are the most successful MOOC applications and can steer MOOC providers toward profitability. So we are applying these blended learning pilots in a number of universities and high schools around the world, from Tsinghua in China to the National University of Mongolia in Mongolia to Berkeley in California, all over the world. And these kinds of technologies really help, the blended model can really help revolutionize education. It can also solve the practical problem of MOOCs, the business aspect. We can also license these MOOC courses to other universities and therein lies a revenue model for MOOCs where the university that licenses it with the professor can use these online courses like the next generation textbook. They can use as much or as little as they like and becomes a tool in, their, in the teacher's arsenal. But despite these successes, MOOCs are still problematic. Their completion rates are low. Only about 5% of students starting a course stay to the end. 
And some critics think that instead of lifting up the undereducated, these courses will further stratify the economic classes, leaving the poor with their MOOCs and the rich with their harbors. According to Shanna Jaggers of Columbia, MOOCs have increased access to higher learning, but not for every population group. In fact, the main beneficiaries are white, educated professionals. The digital divide is still very real. Studies of performance at community colleges show that the students don't learn the material as well in the purely online courses as they do in face-to-face -face classes. To succeed, online courses must offer stronger personal connections and better guidance from instructors. Even with these growing pains, most universities think MOOCs can teach them something about online pedagogy. Universities are hoping MOOCs can give them real-time feedback from students. They're also turning to MOOCs for help with logistical issues, like authentication for online learners. Coursera's signature track uses multiple forms of user authentication. Photo IDs, webcams, credit cards, and even individual typing patterns to verify that people taking a course are really who they say they are. And universities are looking to MOOCs for ideas on how to improve assessment of qualitative subjects. Coursera is working on ways to grade the sort of exams that computers can, such as essays, public speaking, and performance pieces. To do so, Coursera trains students to grade peers and crowdsources the evaluations. In this clip, Daphne Kohler, Coursera's founder, tells us how peer grading teaches students critical thinking skills. So one of the things that we hear from our students is that this, um, the peer grading, like um, auto grading, actually has pedagogical benefits that are the transcend scalability. Specifically, by being given the opportunity to not only look at, but also critically evaluate the work of other students, relative to carefully defined grading rubric, students learn a tremendous amount from that critical thinking process. They learn what makes for a good piece of work and what makes for a bad piece of work. And that really teaches them to think critically about those types of assignments and how to do them better. And in many of those courses, the instructor also asks the students to having, who have completed the grading process to go back and use the same grading rubric on their own assignment so they can think about what they did well and what they could have done better. And we're told by many students that this is actually um, a much more valuable learning experience than actually doing the work themselves. MOOC providers are also experimenting with ways to reward progress. One tool is the digital badge, which students get at the end of a short course to verify that they've learned a specific skill. But the badges are really portals, leading students to the next course level, just as video game gamers advance to the next level after meeting challenges. Penn State, Carnegie Mellon, the University of California, and the Smithsonian are all developing badges. And Mozilla, which is spearheading the digital badge movement, is working with MOOCs to develop a course that would use its own badge system. MOOCs present universities with many promising opportunities. So where do libraries come in? One of the biggest issues for institutions that offer MOOCs is intellectual property. Who owns the course content? And who owns the rights associated with course materials? At universities, professors traditionally own their scholarship, not the institution. MOOCs may change the relationship. In their contracts with universities, MOOC providers typically cede all of the rights, but don't necessarily specify who the owner is, the instructor, or the university. Under contracts with Coursera, the instructor owns, unless the university provides the resources to produce the MOOC, then the ownership is joint. As MOOCs proliferate, universities may try to use the joint ownership provisions as a wedge to change the rules about ownership of intellectual property produced by their faculty. The fight will grow more intense as materials used in MOOCs shift from print to multimedia. Matthew Dames, 
the interim dean of libraries at Syracuse University, warns that the question of who owns the ancillary material used in courses could up being a huge individual copyright issue, or even worse, a massively complex joint copyright issue. For universities, a lot of the onus of managing ownership interest will fall on libraries, which hold huge volumes of intellectual property in their owned and licensed digital repositories. With a MOOC, thousands of people might be pulling or streaming multimedia material at the same time. Libraries will be responsible for managing and monitoring the use of these resources, and they'll need to adopt new technologies to help them control access to their material and tighten internet safeguards. What is the role of the librarian in this world? Since librarians control the information stores that MOOCs will draw upon, librarians have a chance to take the lead in giving students what they want, teacher presence, guidance, and direction. If the focus of the university curriculum is shifting to careers, librarians, uh, libraries can do more to provide information about job markets. We can work with students and faculty on industry analysis and give students tools and skills to do research on employers. Libraries can also work with alumni offices to help them track students, say, through databases linking students with successful alumni. Librarians will have to be much more creative in how they present information and services, though. We'll need to improve the user interface to our material for instance, we might embed library services in collections and consultations within a MOOC. We can embed subject librarians in a MOOC student forum to provide research assistance when other students can't answer a question. And we can continue to develop online modes of instruction that use open resources. Libraries have a desperate need for staff with better technology skills, which means either training librarians or hiring from outside the profession. And if libraries hire non-librarians, we have to be ready for a shift in our organizational cultures. We have to be open to allowing our culture to change to embrace the habits and practices of non-librarian professionals. We also can't expect new money to support these changes. We're going to have to make choices about reallocating funds, and we'll risk upsetting existing clientele who like things the way they are. Librarians will also play a central role in supporting faculty who teach online courses. MOOCs and other online education tools allow large-scale, real-time assessment of student work and behavior. Massive data require precise metadata, the information we need to identify and retrieve material. And librarians are trained to analyze, select, and implement metadata. Librarians have other ways to support MOOCs, too. In her research report on MOOCs and libraries, Carmen Kazakoff lane suggests a few. Librarians can provide intellectual property services and advice from copyright experts, which would let an institution offer an open course without fear of legal retribution. To help MOOC students who need to do research but don't have access to standard campus resources, Librarians can guide professors in structuring courses to include access to faculty office hours and library services. Librarians can also help devise new ways of assessing the effectiveness of MOOCs. Libraries must also adopt technologies to manage and monitor MOOC usage of library resources so they can control access and tighten internet safeguards. Typically, Libraries give walk-in patrons access to resources, but restrict remote access to users affiliated with the college or university. This model works reasonably well when there is a known population. For MOOCs, that is not the case. So libraries will have to develop a new licensing model that can safely open up their resources to a huge national and international market. One model that might work is an opt-in model for both patrons and vendors. Some MOOC students might take courses without ever using library electronic resources, resources, but students who would like access to those resources could opt for a premium service at an additional charge. Those who opt in might pay a flat fee 
plus a per item charge. Operationally, signing up for a library service could be part of the course registration process with the MOOC provider passing ID information to the library. On the library side, patron taking MOOC courses exclusively would be separate from the main patron file. An authentication scheme such as Easy Proxy would distinguish MOOC patrons logging in remotely from traditional students and faculty. Setting aside a range of IP addresses for MOOC students would let institutions restrict the number or speed of downloads. And separating out the MOOC students would let librarians distinguish usage generated by MOOCs from usage by the main university population, helping make sure that pirates aren't downloading the entire database. Librarians already have experience in facing down challenges posed by new technology and limits on resources. And they're starting to make academic libraries more entrepreneurial. Google, by giving anyone with an internet connection the ability to retrieve information instantly, threatened to take over the role of university libraries. But we adapted by providing services that draw on rapid innovation such as information literacy instruction and online tutorials. We adapted by doing outreach in classrooms and cafes to let our clients know that we can help them navigate the new environment. And we redesigned the library space to bring people in, to foster teamwork, to take advantage of the kind of unstructured transactions on which the online world already relies. We also have to respond to new demands that are making our work and collaborations even more complex. Users today expect immediate access to new technologies, and we've pursued opportunities to give them what they want. A number of university library systems have formed very effective partnerships of a scope that didn't exist before online technology emerged, such as libraries that outsource their resources to support an online program at another school. We know that if we don't help create the future, the future might not include us. As librarians, we are in the best position to confront these challenges because we work at the intersection of technology and pedagogy, and we are well equipped to understand technology's broader implications and its impact on teaching, learning, and scholarship. Understanding the different business models of online learning ventures and their impact on education norms, on privacy, sharing, intellectual property, and accreditation will help us confront the legal territory ahead. By studying MOOCs and the wider online landscape, we can help guide the changes to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Curtis and Irene. Um, we will open the floor now to questions. If there are any, please type them in the question box, and um, we'll see uh, what, what sort of questions our audience has. In the meantime, um, I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on what CUNY is doing uh, in the library with regard to MOOCs. Uh, so far, uh, CUNY has uh, developed a couple of MOOCs, but the, um, they rely on an open, one, one of them in particular relies on, on open materials. It's really, it's really what we're calling a POOC, which is a public uh, <laughs> on, open online course um, having to do with, with New York City. And it's open to anyone in the city, you know, or anyone really. Um, and individuals contribute materials and their discussion, their discussion groups and so forth. Um, we're also, we have a, a MOOC for, uh, for a science course. It's really more of a flipped classroom approach, so um, not, not a massive open course, but a for credit course where we're using um, MOOC type technology in order to, um, to, to manage that course, to run that course. But uh, you know, that doesn't rely so much on, on library materials. It, it's more, this is more of a you know, traditional um, a pedagogical approach. It's not using um, the library to support that course. Do, do you uh, see it or foresee a time when there might be something called a MOOC librarian who would deal only with the, the customers who are 
attending the MOOC and maybe not the traditional student? You know, I, th I think that's a very real possibility. Um, you know, we have to look at a lot of the resource issues involved in that and, um, you know, clearly as a, you know, as a public funded university, you know, we have to be careful about, you know, how we're using tax dollars, taxpayer dollars. So, you know, something like that I think would need to have, uh, you know, support coming from an external uh, revenue source in order to, uh, for us to have a position that would be supporting people who aren't um, so directly related to the university. Um, but that's, that could be a very important position uh, in terms of working out some of the licensing materials, licensing for materials that students might need access to. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, that could be a very interesting model and something I think we're, we're likely to see uh, in the not too distant future. We have a few questions from the audience. Um, first of all, can you tell us more about what direction Coursera is moving in, and are you seeing the number of offerings starting to slow down? Um, I don't uh, believe that that is um, accurate, but I, I can research that. Uh, uh, question and answer um, it. I don't have the figures at my fingertips, but well, I don't think that it's it's slowing down. I don't get that impression from the reading that we've done. Mm -hmm. Well, if, Irene, if you do find some information about that, we could send it out um, to the attendees uh, after the fact. Okay. Next question um, uh, from CCNMTL at Columbia. You'll probably know what that stands for. edX is a not-for-profit venture-funded MOOC platform. It's nonprofit. Will there be a distinction to be made between nonprofit platforms and venture-funded commercial ones? I think eventually um, the ones that are ostensibly nonprofit are going to need to figure out a way of recouping their expenses. I mean, they may, you know, continue to be you know, non-profit, you know, at least nominally non-profit, but there's going to have to be some element of a revenue stream in order for them to be um, self-sustaining. All right, another question. This one about database licensing. Please elaborate on how libraries can change database licensing given vendor restrictions. Well, only with the uh, consent of the vendor. Um, that would be something where the vendor would need, well, really two things. They would need to see um, some potential for additional revenue coming in, um, which is certainly a possibility. And I mean, the second and more, I think, um, critical issue, uh, we've talked about this some, is in having safeguards uh, to make sure that only the people who are supposed to have access to the material have access to it. So you get into all sorts of issues of, of authentication there. And you know, I don't, I don't think you know, there will be, at least initially, a lot of vendors who are, are willing to um, you know, take that risk. But I think if we can find a few that are willing and see a potential market here, um, that they could really, you know, extend um, you know, some of their, their revenue quite, quite substantially, given the numbers of students that we're talking about. And a question, how receptive have publishers been to these new licenses allowing MOOC use? Is there room in this space for third-party solutions in the MOOC space, such as CIPIX? And I guess it might be helpful to explain, if you could, what CIPIX is since I'm not sure everybody will know? No? Um, yeah. <laughs> you think, you're thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking about what CIFIC says. Yeah. Maybe the person who asked oh, the question. It's the Stanford um, Intellectual Property Exchange, I think it's called, that, that, that uh, helps universities uh, with their um, copyright clearances for courses. Right, right. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a role for organizations like that, or or the copyright clearinghouse um, potentially. Um, so, yeah. Well, I, All right. Yeah, Irene, you have anything to add? Um, I think that UCLA has also, um, you know, a similar uh, department of for um, copyright um, and intellectual property. Um, All right, we have another question here. Um, has CUNY been able to negotiate a new licensing model with any vendor to include MOOC students? Not yet. No. no. Are you aware of anybody who has? No. So that's new territory to be charted, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, let me see if there are any other questions. I think that that is the end of our questions. Um, so uh, I suppose it, uh, where, where time is quite good, we can um, move on to wrap up our, uh, our presentation this afternoon. And I want to thank uh, you and uh, Curtis, you and Irene, for your thought-provoking and insightful comments. I think your presentation has highlighted the critical role of the library in the evolution of higher education, and MOOCs is one aspect of that evolution. Uh, you will soon be sent a brief survey about today's session, and we hope you will take a moment to respond. Your answers will help guide the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee, the group responsible for these series of webinars, in planning future offerings. If um, you could change the screen now to, to my slide, that would be helpful. As we conclude today's session, I would like to bring to your attention several additional continuing education events. On Friday, the 4th of April, in response to requests for continuing education that address the needs of colleagues in Latin America, ELECTS will offer a Spanish language version of the webinar, Understanding RDA in an Easy Way. Also in April, we will present two special webinars in conjunction with Preservation Week, and our CE calendar will conclude with two more webinars about MOOCs in May and June. Thank you again to Curtis and Irene for challenging us to consider the relationship between libraries and MOOCs. And thank you to Iping Chen Gaffey for her technical support. We wish you a good afternoon and look forward to welcoming you again at an ELECTS webinar in the future.